Okay. Well, welcome. Um, I'm Janet Reyes, the Geospatial Information Librarian here at UC Riverside. And what I'm going to do here, because we know there's always people who are joining in the waiting room, whatever. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes, um, just general things. Then I'll launch a poll, uh, just three quick questions for you guys, just so I can see um, what the audience is like today. And then um, I'll talk a little bit more, and then we'll get into the screen sharing and the uh, really launch the, the workshop for good, right? So um, welcome, and I want to congratulate you, because I think you're really smart to check out what a geographic information system, or GIS, is all about. Um, you may have heard other people have learned it, and um, they have maybe their own impressions of what it's like. Um, so you're smart to check this out in a low barrier way. It's, it's a free workshop, just a couple hours of your time. And uh, you can judge from what happens today whether you think this is something you would want to pursue and learn more about. So um, and GIS, Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, it's really in demand these days. It's great to have on your resume. If it does work out for you, it's something that you think you would like to pursue. Um, good thing to have there. And um, the level of sophistication has just really increased over time and it continues to increase. So it started out in pretty much just two dimensions, you know, on a screen. And then we got into three dimensional representation and now it's taking off with four dimensional, like we have time and animated maps and things like that. So, and who knows what's coming next, right? So it's just really sophisticated, uh, very helpful, growing fast, um, in demand skill to have. So uh, welcome and thanks for being here today to check it out. Um, I can't cover everything that you may wanna know about GIS today. Um, I'm hoping to develop a follow-on workshop to this one uh, where we do get into some of the, the um, features and methods that you might want to use uh, later on. So I apologize in advance if we don't touch on what you were maybe hoping to hear about today. But in an introductory workshop, there's only so much we can cover, right? Um, what we will cover today, let's talk about that for a second. Um, well, what GIS is, uh, the reasons people use it, some basic concepts and terminology, um, options for platforms that you could use, and uh, some basic functions within the platform I have chosen for today. Um, so all of this uh, is, I try to keep people who don't know much about GIS in mind when I put this workshop together, and I'm just trying to give you context for uh, what some people call button pushing, you know, like you learn you just are guided through, do this, click this, now go here and do this. And at the end, you have no idea, like, what did I just do? So I'm trying to give you some context for those steps when, whenever you do encounter them, maybe in a future tutorial or something like that. Um, also, I'm trying to think of what, would might, what might get you in trouble if you were not aware of it, right? So some, some of the content today is not especially exciting or anything, but I do have to go over it, I feel, because I think if you don't know about it and you get some error message and you're like, I have no idea what they're talking about, um, this background information will help you navigate through that situation. So though that's my thinking behind how this workshop is structured. I would now like to launch the poll. So welcome to all who have joined us while I was uh, chatting. And let me get this poll going. It's just three questions real quick and then we'll I'll talk some more while you guys are, are taking this poll and um, then we'll get get going on on the real workshop um, so I do have a co-host today her name is Margarita she's helping out tremendously right now with the waiting room and things like that um, she'll be able to look at the chat because once I start sharing my screen I don't have that ability uh, very well so she'll let me know if there's any um, urgent questions in the chat and uh, we are going to have a couple of breaks. This is a long workshop. I, you know, I've kind of inserted like a, a couple one to two minute breaks, and maybe that'll be the time when we can address some questions that have come up in the uh, in the previous section. Um, toward the end of this workshop, Margarita will put a link in the chat where uh, it'll be a link to a workshop evaluation, and that really helps us librarians a lot 
so we can figure out what we did well, what maybe needs improvement for next time around, what you would like to see that you're not seeing currently from being offered from the library, all that good stuff. So really appreciate it if you just take a minute to, uh, to do that evaluation at the end. Um, some of you might be disappointed to hear this, but I don't have any hands-on activities for you today. We thought really hard about this uh, in offering this workshop and just in the end decided that even if we were giving it in person and you were sitting at a computer in a classroom and there was a screen up in front, it's easy to get lost um, following the directions and things like that. We just decided it'd be a better experience for me to show you some things. Um, also, you will be having access to the slides and a handout and lots of resources for further learning. And I just figured that'll be a better situation for you uh, to practice on your own. Um, lots of tutorials and things like that you're going to be able to access. So uh, I hope you're not grumbling right now that you don't get to do anything today except listen to me and watch what I've got to share. But um, I just think it's going to work out better in general uh, that way. So um, also, this uh, workshop is being recorded. And probably in a week or two, the a captioned recording will be available for viewing on the UCR Library YouTube channel. So if you have to duck out or just get totally bored and have to leave <laughs> for whatever reason, um, and you want to catch the end of it or something like that, um, you'll be able to see the recording um, a, a few weeks down the line. And like I said, two, two hours is a long time. Um, I wish I could condense it and still have it be a good workshop, but I just didn't see how I was going to do that. So there are going to be two short breaks, um, and I'll let you know when those are coming up. And um, let's see. We've got a pretty good representation on the polls right now. So I am going to um, end the polling, and let's see what the results look like. So current level of knowledge, nothing. That's the most common answer, a little, okay. That's all good. Um, we mostly have grad students here today. Okay. I always have to put in that other category because you never know, I'm not gonna think of it. Um, and which mess best matches your area of interest? And we do have a nice distribution, as usual, when I give this workshop. Um, we got social sciences in the lead, so sometimes it's the natural and physical sciences that um, show up the most. But I'm glad to see social sciences represented today. Uh, arts and humanities, too. All right. And one, one person in computer science and the ever-popular other. So great to have you all here today. I'm going to uh, stop sharing the results now. And let's see, I need to start screen sharing. So let's get to that. And let's go. Okay, I'll get this out of the way too. So here's my introductory slide. There's my name, if you missed it in the beginning. I'm the Geospatial Information Librarian at UC Riverside, and we're happy to have you here today. Before we go too much further, I just wanted to share this UCR land acknowledgement with you if you haven't seen it in the past. Um, certainly, we're talking about the land today and the way we view the land and think about the land, and it really helps, especially in a workshop like this, to take a moment to acknowledge our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of the land that UCR is situated on. Um, we are just grateful that we have the opportunity to, uh, to live and work on the homelands of these peoples. Uh, of course, most of us, or maybe none of us, are there today. We are all dispersed. So at the bottom of the slide, I hope you can see that I've inserted a link to a map, a GIS map where um, that one of my colleagues let me know about and this shows the uh, native lands uh, throughout the United States and uh, most of North America, I believe, and maybe other parts of the world as well. So if you're curious and once you get the slides where the links will be live for you as well, so no need to, um, you know, copy down anything or, or take pictures of your screen or anything like that. But 
when you get the slides, which is probably tomorrow, um, you'll be able to follow that link and, and uh, see uh, which peoples were uh, taking care of the land before you got to where you are today. All right, so let's start with a definition of GIS, shall we? A geographic Information System does all of these things that I listed here. And I, I think I like this uh, definition so much, there are many others, of course, but I like how it breaks it down. And I want to uh, just let you know that you can be, have a career in GIS, as I did before I became a librarian, and you don't necessarily have to be an expert or super wonderful at all of these aspects of a GIS. So in my previous job, I was um, making maps mostly or often from aerial photo interpretation. So my experience with GIS is all about capturing data. And I didn't have to know too much about managing it or making lovely presentation maps. Um, other people did that. We just compiled the data and gave it to our clients and they did what they needed to do with the data. So just to show you, um, you know, you can go a lot of different ways with a career in GIS or using GIS for research or whatever. Um, yeah, you don't have to be an expert in all things. So let's talk about what is geographic information. We talked about what a GIS is. So um, what is geographic information? It can be associated with any of the following. Uh, a place name. So think of California or uh, Riverside County or, you know, Poughkeepsie, New York, right? Um, natural features too. So the Mississippi River, uh, Lake Shasta, you know, any, anything, um, anything like that will work as geographic information in a GIS. Um, I'm trying to think of the right adjective for these kind of things, not mundane, but these are just like less well-known things, uh, ways of breaking down our, our Earth's surface. Um, we don't always know off the top of our heads what census tract we live in, for instance, or school district, but these are all geographic um, features that can be put on a map. They can be, and they often are put on a map, as a matter of fact. Um, street address. So this is something that has evolved over the course of uh, the evolution of GIS, where you can have uh, street addresses, that, and if they're formatted properly, you can load them into a GIS, and it will produce points on a map corresponding to those street addresses. So that's a very nice feature to have. And uh, we also have our good old-fashioned uh, coordinates, like when we think about whatever we learned about geography, if we ever learned about geography, Right, so you've got latitude and longitude on the surface of, of the globe. Um, out here in the west, we have the public land survey where things are broken down by township range, section, quarter section, quarter, quarter section, you know, those kind of things. Um, anything like that is considered geographic information. In fact, I think about the only thing I can think of that maybe wouldn't fit into a GIS very well is. Um, those kind of directions you get sometimes where people say, well, you go down two traffic lights and then you turn right and then you look for the red house. You know, the GIS is not going to understand that, right? Not, not a big surprise there, but all of this other stuff, it will, or it can. So I always like this slide because I think it gets people, or I hope it gets uh, people thinking about, oh yeah, I could use GIS this way. Um, so let's just run through this and I hope you'll be thinking about if any of these fit into how you see yourself possibly using GIS. So my first bullet point there is location. And I think of location in a couple different ways. One would be, um, I am here in um, Miami Beach. What's around me? Where's the nearest uh, Mexican restaurant or Cuban restaurant? And where's the hospital? Because I don't feel well, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we're used to using that on our phones, right? Um, location can also be, I'm interested in where all the um, habitat for uh, bald eagles are. Show me everywhere on the planet where that thing is. So that's two different ways to look at location. And um, I've put a link in the slides to a map that I, I'm pretty sure many of you have looked at over the last several months. It's the Johns Hopkins University um, map and dashboard for the coronavirus outbreak. And that's certainly um, showing us the location and the quantity of a number of cases for the coronavirus. Um, yeah. So um, 
and some of these pat these um, categories they kind of overlap with each other so they're not super distinct from one another but you get the general idea um, patterns and associations this is what I think about I think most of us would agree that no matter what you're talking about whether it's a natural kind of phenomenon or a social phenomenon it's not evenly distributed across the landscape there are like think about say income levels below ten thousand dollars a year or something that's not evenly distributed through the county or the united states or anything like that so there's some areas where that's not the case at all there's some areas where that's pretty prevalent same thing with um like very sandy soils um that's not evenly distributed everywhere there's some places where there's more some places where there's less so let's take a look at the patterns that are are uh, we're seeing right and um you might start thinking about well why is that why is there something here and not there and that's where we get into associations so um if you have bald eagle habitat and you see where it is and you might be wondering well why is it here and not over here where it seems like it's almost the same type of situation so then you can get into looking at what else might be going on that uh, contributes to the pattern we're seeing right um trends here i'm thinking about change over time so um gis is great for that um, think about maybe prevalence of um heart attacks and in your city and it could be well how has that changed over time are there more heart attacks per you know per population unit um has it changed at a consistent rate um why might that be so you know that's another thing that you can look at with the gis and then the last point is um impacts of changes so this could be looking at changes that have happened in the past for instance um here's a free flowing river and somebody put a dam on it and what happened downstream after that happened what was different before and after right um, but then GIS can also be used for modeling what might happen in the future. So if here's a stream and we put a dam on this one, what might we think happens? And we can show, represent that in a GIS. Um, yeah, so, or citing a warehouse in this neighborhood, what's that going to do to the air pollution levels and, and so forth. So you get the idea, right? Um, GIS can answer any of these types of questions. So here's another way to frame this, and I'll go through most of these pretty quickly because I think they're pretty um, obvious. The ones that are not, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more at length about. So viewing, um, lots of us, maybe without realizing it, we use GIS almost every week, I would say, um, on our phones, maybe on the computer, looking at maps or imagery. And sometimes that's all we want to do is just, is just see what's there. Um, down below, I added this to the slide. I've given this workshop a few times and I have to continually update it because things change. Um, dashboards are becoming, and things like that are becoming more and more popular. So a lot of times now when we go to look at a map of something, we'll see the map itself, but then we'll also see data that's associated with the map. So it's kind of a combination of uh, seeing numbers, seeing graphs, and seeing the map. So sometimes that's what we need to do. We just need to view it, use, you know, use it as a user that way. Um, creating maps, you can create a map that's very, very simple or extremely complex. This is an example of a simple map that I made when I first got to UCR. And all I was doing was trying to plot the center points of uh, aerial photography that was taken over Riverside County in 1938. And I'll tell you, it's pretty difficult. Uh, there's been a lot of change between 1938 and 2010. So I couldn't honestly tell where I was all the time. But um, anyway, all I was doing was just putting points down to represent the center points of the photos. And uh, pretty simple, but uh, could be very useful, right? Uh, 3D models, I was talking about this at the beginning where we've evolved from 2D to 3D. Um, so on the top, that's an image from Mars. So not only is GIS used on our planet, but it can be used on other celestial bodies as well, right? Um, and at the bottom, this is getting to be more and more popular where we see 3D representations of the landscape, um, illustrating like where the terrain goes, gets higher, lower, 
the heights of the buildings, things like that. So all of this is possible now with the GIS. And visualizations. So again, this is a, a part of it that's just evolved very fast in the last, I would say, five to 10 years. Um, remember I was talking about the fourth dimension time and I really like how they've developed this. Um, you can see it's um, tr tracking traffic accidents over time. And each of these little hexagon stacks of slices represents a period of time. So the one at the bottom is the earliest period of time and the gray means um, no change in the number of accidents. But as the, the color red deepens, that means there's more accidents happening compared to the original uh, level of accidents for that slice of time. And back here in the corner, you see there's some blue um, slices and that means uh, the number of accidents is going down. So think about how useful this is to traffic or transportation planners and how difficult it would have been in the past to try to visualize this information. So um, uh, this is just a great example. Over here, um, another example, I think this was made from, yes, from Google Earth. Um, you kind of get the feeling that the spikes represent a quantity of something and the taller the spike, the more of that is happening at that location. So I will tell you that this is um, Manhattan and surrounding areas and it's each spike represents a Starbucks and it's the number of visitors per unit of time, whatever that was. So right now, you know where you're gonna be standing in line for an awfully long time if you visit this particular Starbucks. Many ways to analyze. Um, I'm just gonna show you a few. Um, so overlay, that's the, um, the reason that GIS was developed in the first place, it was for people like forest managers and uh, land use planners and things like that, when they're trying to think of which areas we need to protect the most or which areas are okay for development, there's a lot of different factors that can go into that decision. You want maybe a flat slope, but you also need maybe some soil types or you need to rule out some soil types, like a swamp would not be so good for siting your, your warehouse, right? Um, and any other kind of feature that you can think of. So a GIS enables us to put all these different layers together and kind of weight them. And for this attribute, um, I need it to be this amount or less or this amount or more and so forth and so on. And then you can come up with a, a result, which you see at the bottom. In this case, it was agricultural pollution potential. And you can see the value of this and you can see how in the old days, um, looking at uh, transparent overlays on top of a paper map and switching off all the overlays to understand what's going on is very tedious. So GIS enables us to do this. And it's still used a lot for this kind of application today. Buffering. So uh, a couple different ways you can use a buffer. I liked this example. Um, back when they were thinking about erecting farmer's field in Los Angeles, one student at UCLA just used a buffer to determine um, who's, how many, uh, families are going to be impacted by the noise that's generated from an event at the field. And of course, the, the noise dissipates over distance and things like that. Uh, very, very nice use of buffering. Sometimes also buffering is important, say, in um, land use ordinances where like a liquor store can't be sited within X number of feet of a school, and things like that. So all kinds of ways you can use buffering. Routing, I think we're pretty used to this um, with our phones and everything when we need to get from point A to point B. In this case, it was a route that needed to be bringing back to the beginning again. And uh, which way we could get to visit all the hospitals in San Francisco and get back to our point of origin. And the GIS can help calculate that. Spatial statistics. So remember I talked about things not being evenly distributed across the landscape and you might see an area where it's on a map where it seems like there's more of this thing, whatever it is, going on in this area, but you might wonder, but is that statistically significant? And fortunately, GIS has tools built into it that can help you determine whether it is statistically significant, and you can re reject or accept the null hypothesis about uh, what's going on in that area. So yeah, I. Uh, very handy, very handy tool to have. Okay, I like view sheds and watersheds, so I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. Um, it's a concept many of us don't know about. 
a, a view shed would be like imagine this is a person and all you do is kind of swing that person around as if they're looking looking around all around them and you figure out what they can see and what they can't see because it's obscured by something else in the landscape so this is helpful for uh, maybe citing tall towers or things that you know might detract from a view in a certain area and um, also it's I've heard it used for like positioning sharpshooters along a parade route when there are dignitaries who are going to go through a city in a parade they want to make sure all angles are covered so yeah view, sh view sheds are one thing um, watershed is the concept of if a drop of water falls on the ground here which way is it going to roll um, so if it's where my arrow is right now is going to come down this way and go out that way. If it's just a little bit further on the other side of this ridge, it's going to go down the other way. So you can understand the um, implications of why um, for studies of pollution and other things, um, knowing your watersheds is, is a very handy thing to have. And last, I wanted to include this slide, which is a poster done by students at UC Santa Barbara. And I wanted to draw your attention to the um, diagram at the bottom right corner. So this is how you can use modeling in spatial analysis. This is going back to the overlays. Remember, I talked about that a few minutes ago. They're trying to figure out what factors might contribute to us finding um, Chumash settlement sites on Santa Cruz Island. So they, they came up with what layers they wanted to look at. They came up with the parameters of what characteristics each of those layers would have and they developed a model that they could run in the GIS and come out with the results. Okay, so we're pivoting a little bit now from all those examples. Hopefully that got you thinking um, about what you might be able to do with the GIS. Now we're gonna get into some of the background. Um, there are two types of data in a GIS. One is spatial, which is of course no big surprise there, right? And the other is tabular, which you might not fully realized, but that's what drives a lot of the power behind a GIS. So we're going to take a look at both of these types of data. Vector data. Okay, does this remind you of geometry? Yes, vectors, points, lines, and polygons. Um, and you think about mapping, it's really a lot of applied geometry, right? Um, and you remember your Cartesian coordinates and the x and y axis, and you can tell about the position of any feature by knowing where it is on the x-axis and where it is on the y-axis. Well, that's what GIS does. And so for points, um, that's just one feature with one value for x and y value. Um, and in this case that we're looking at, uh, these points might represent, um, say, manholes in the street, um, also probably pipe fittings. So um, yeah, it's some, and there all this information can be associated with each of those points. For lines in this example, we're probably looking at pipes. Um, in, in the orangey tan kind of shapes that we see, those are the polygons. So um, that's, and those are representing, say, um, parcels in this subdivision. Now, this um, example that I found had annotation also on the slide, and annotation is not vector data but it is a, a layer that you'll see on some maps. Um, so I just wanted to point out that annotation is not uh, vector data, but it, it is on this, on this uh, representation that I found that illustrates the other three types of vector data. So other than vector data, we have raster data, and we're all kind of used to thinking about rasters. Anytime we evaluate getting a new TV screen or a computer monitor or um, our phones and we, we want to know about the resolution things like that um, so a raster is an array of pixels and all of the pixels are the same size and all of the pixels are assigned a value so raster data is good for when you want to represent a continuous surface of something so it's used in elevation that's the most common example after imagery itself um, all, all of our computer imagery is, um, is a raster information, or scanned um, maps or documents, those are rasters as well. Um, also used for things like uh, maybe temperature or a wind velocity, 
um, anything where you don't want a polygon where it says, okay, everything inside this polygon is between 10 or 20 of whatever you're measuring, but you want to know that the uh, individual distribution of here it's 17, here it's 19, here it's 20, here it goes back to 17. You know, if you need that kind of granularity, um, a raster is a good way to capture that. Okay, so you might be thinking, where am I going to get this spatial data? Where am I going to get vector data or raster data? So here's, here are my answers to that question. Um, for vector especially, you might be the one, like I used to do, drafting points, lines, and or polygons. You might be able to create that right within a GIS. Uh, more likely though, especially for starting out, you'll probably be acquiring your spatial data from elsewhere. So for raster data, you might acquire it um, by flying a drone in a, in a systematic pattern and covering a whole you know, area, for instance, and that'll be rendered as raster data. Um, you might find existing files for either vector or raster data. And I've listed some of the places where you can find these. Um, some, some sites are known as data repositories or portals, and they might have a combination of geospatial data and other types of data. And then there are some repositories or portals that are just for geospatial data. So just wanted to point that out. That's why I've got these parentheses here. Um, and there's um, government agencies, anything from local to national now has, uh, a lot of them have portals or repositories where you can download geospatial data. Um, the United Nations and the World Bank are also great resources for more global um, information, spatial information. Nonprofits, uh, World Wildlife Fund is one I can think of, I, I believe has a, a website where you can download information pertaining to endangered species and things like that. Um, universities often have their own repositories of uh, data generated at the university and maybe from beyond. And then Esri, which is a company we're gonna be talking about and using their software today. Esri has what's called the Living Atlas of the World and they have um, thousands of maps that are authoritative and on many, many topics. So you can take a browse through what they have there in the Living Atlas and it might provide you with just the data that you need to bring in uh, to your GIS for your analysis. And then you might get um, information from your coworkers or collaborators. Um, so they might say, hey, I did this and I want you to see it and they can share that with you and that you could bring into your own instance of a GIS and maybe do some more analysis uh, jumping off from where they, they got to. And I wanted to point out here at the bottom that um, I'm, I'm mostly talking about uh, spatial data that has information associated with it but it's also possible from some of these sites just to download uh, data that gives you just the basic shapes. Kind of think back to when you were maybe in elementary school and they gave you a map of your country with all the provinces or states there and you had to fill in you know, something in each state. So sometimes all you do is get the shell and then you can populate that shell with the data that you want to provide it. In addition to just getting something that has both the, uh, the shapes and whatever, and the data associated with it. All right, so we talked about the spatial data. We've got vector and raster, those two styles. Now the tabular data is what makes a GIS so powerful. And um, you'll see this term a lot, attribute table. So it's associated with the shapes that you see on the screen. And you see at the bottom, I've got an example of a attribute table and it's got columns. So each row in the attribute table corresponds to one of the shapes on the screen. Here I've got some parking lots and so I've highlighted two of them. And then your attribute table can have as many columns as you want with any kind of data about that feature that you can collect. So, um, and you can see it doesn't always have to be numerical data. It could be uh, alphanumeric, it could be just you know, a phrase, it could be a sentence even. It could be a link to a website. It could be all kinds of things. So this is what makes it powerful because you can pay attention to 
the data just in one column or a combination of columns. You can do all kinds of things. And that's a, you know, it it's, makes it so much more powerful than a static map where you're just looking at one thing at a time. So um, the records in the table link to the map features by ID number. So um, you see this object ID, that's the guy, that's the column that's gonna be important because there's another file sitting somewhere in the GIS where say this is um, object ID number four and it's got all the information about how that shape is, is um, you know, the outlines of the shape and where it's situated. And then it links to the table here, the attribute table that tells us all about um, all the attributes of that feature. So that's the link there. Um, that's how GIS does its magic. So now you might be wondering, okay, well, where am I going to find data for my attribute table? Well, you can populate the table while mapping. If you're making a map from scratch, um, that'll be up to you to you know, decide what columns you want in your attribute table and what kind of valid values those columns might have. So for instance, if you've got a column that's um, counties of California, um, and you, you, know, you can type in things and you can always mistype or maybe mispaste something in. So you don't want to have something that says banana in your column of counties of California. That's just like wrong. So you can set you know, a limitation on what would be the valid values for that column. Um, you can find data from external sources and I've shown you here on this slide what those might be. Um, and whatever the external source is, it's got to have that kind of information that the GIS will recognize as, oh, this is geospatial information. So whether it's latitude, longitude, or some kind of identifier like we talked about, a place name, um, a natural feature name, a census tract, um, or an address if you've got uh, address uh, information formatted in the right uh, appropriate format for that GIS, um, that'll be great. It can load it up and you can create a, a bunch of points on your map from that. Um, so like I mentioned, or kind of alluded to with my banana example, um, a GIS, it's, it's going to be expecting the data in a certain format and you might need to do some data cleaning if you're getting your information from external sources. And another example of that is, um, say you have a map that's a shell of maybe the counties of California. Um, and it, in your shape file, which is what it's called, maybe they identify the counties by just spelling out the county name. Maybe you find some data that talks about counties of California, but they've got what's called a FIPS code, which is a numerical value that's associated with all these different places in, in the United States. Um, the GIS is not necessarily going to know that that's the same thing. Or another example would be spelling out the names of the states versus the two letter abbreviation for the state. If one table has it one way and your GIS has it the other way, it's not going to recognize that those are the same things. So if you're loading in data from somewhere else, um, most likely, maybe not in all cases, but a lot of times you'll need to do some data cleaning to get it in the right format before you can move forward with it. Okay, um, now we're going to start talking about what we're using today. So I mentioned Esri once before, and Esri is a company that makes computer software for GIS, and it is the market leader uh, by far. Um, I'm not sure exactly what percentage they have, of, <clears throat> excuse me, they have of the market, but it's a big percentage. And they just happen to be located um, in Redlands, California, which is 15 miles northeast of UC Riverside. And in fact, there is some connection from the very, very, very early days of Esri in the late 60s. Some of the very first employees were UCR graduate students. Um, and now, you know, from the, that handful of people, it's now a company that employs probably tens of thousands, um, offices all over the planet. Um, it's, just, it's just exploded tremendously. Um, and most of their products have this phrase in it, ArcGIS. So if anybody talks to you about ArcGIS, you know that it is a proprietary software and it's coming from this company, Esri. 
So this slide I just copied off of their website, um, the suite of Esri products. There's a lot. You can see that there's a lot. And I've put some arrows on uh, to draw your attention to a few of the things that we'll be talking about today. So this uh, rather prominent arrow, that's pointing to ArcGIS Pro, and that's the platform I'll be demonstrating for you today. Uh, this is the first time I'm offering this workshop using ArcGIS Pro, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, I've got this faded arrow over here on the left side, and it's pointing to ArcGIS Desktop. That's what's been in use, and ArcMap is a subset of ArcGIS de Desktop. And that's what's been in use for the last 20 years. However, Esri introduced Pro uh, recently, and they're trying, they're putting all their development energy into uh, getting Pro to do everything and more that ArcGIS, Map, ArcGIS Desktop or ArcMap could do. Um, so I, up until now, I've been giving this workshop using ArcMap, but I think now is the time to switch over to using Pro. And that's why I'm showing you Pro today. I also have an arrow here pointing to ArcGIS Online. And that's another thing that you need to know about. Um, it's growing and growing in popularity. And I'm planning on giving a workshop on ArcGIS Online in the fall quarter. Um, so stay tuned for that. But you can see there's a lot of other apps here. Um, most of them have the phrase ArcGIS in them, right? But here's just, um, this set is just for apps that you would use in the field. Um, we got story maps at the bottom of this column and I gave a workshop on story maps just last week. So all kinds of uh, permutations of the basic idea of GIS. But we're gonna be focusing on this one in particular and I'll touch on these other two as well today. So here's what ArcGIS Online looks like. Um, at least this is what it looks like for now. Um, in a month or two, um, the basic way that it looks when you get to a screen like this is going to change. Um, so next time I give this workshop, I'll have a different uh, image here uh, to illustrate it. But you can see it's pretty clean. Um, not a lot of stuff at the top. Um, yeah, nice clean look to it. And of course, this is all online, so when you're ready, you can share it, and anybody in the world, if you want, could, could see your, the map that you've created. Um, so like it says down here at the bottom, um, a workshop is coming soon when we can talk about ArcGIS Online. But ArcGIS Online is also kind of important if you're going to use Pro, and I'll get to that in a second. So ArcMap, this is our, our dear friend from the last 20 years. This is what it looks like, and you can see that it's got a lot of buttons and icons up here. Um, and there, there's more. You could, you could drag in a whole bunch more if you wanted to. So um, yeah, that's the basic look. And you can see like, here's a map. It's not necessarily a pretty looking map, but it's very utilitarian. And sometimes that's all you need, right? Um, yeah, so that's ArcMap. And then this is what ArcGIS Pro looks like. So if you notice at the top, Instead of all those icons, what we now have are ribbon tabs, and they kind of mimic what Microsoft does with its products. So you can go to a particular tab, and you can find a, a set of uh, tools that kind of relate to each other or things that you might want to use um, you know, all at once kind of thing. Um, you can also see that there is more than one view um, on this screen, whereas before we just could see one map at a time, now we can see uh, several maps at once. We can see a 3D image. Um, all of these are, are much improved over ArcMap. So you might be asking yourself, well, I've heard people use ArcMap, and I've heard some people are not sure about Pro, so what should I learn to use? And I'm just putting this out there for your information. Um, I've already touched on some of these things, right? Um, ArcMap's been in use for 20 years now. It's transitioning to mature support. A good thing about it is that it runs on most computers. It doesn't take a lot of um, you know, memory or anything like that, comparatively. Um, so if you need to make a map and you have some limitations on your, um, the power of your computer, ArcMap might be the better choice. If you're affiliated with UCR, there's two ways you can get to ArcMap. Um, you can access it versus via a Porto, which is like a virtual lab machine. 
um, and I've given you the, the link or the uh, where you would go to start that off. Um, we'll take a look about at that in a little bit. Um, you can also get ArcMap loaded onto your computer by uh, requesting a license at this address from ITS at, UC at UCR. Now Pro was released in 2015 and the transition to Pro hasn't gone quite as fast as uh, Esri would have preferred. There's been a lot of resistance because people are so used to ArcMap, but it is catching on more and more now. Um, the tricky thing about Pro is it does require a robust computer capacity to run well. And I've included a link here to a tool. It looks a little um, sketchy, but it's legit. And you can just um, click the link on that tool and it will tell you whether your computer measures up as far as what the minimum qualifications are to run Pro well. 64-bit um, machine is preferred, for instance. Um, kind of think about like a gaming sort of computer would pretty much be the kind of thing that would Pro would work well on, that kind of power. So at UCR, um, again, two ways to go about getting Pro. Um, again, you can use a Porto, and that's what I'm going to be demonstrating, or at least alluding to today. Um, and also, you can download and access um, information for your, your uh, session by establishing an ArcGIS Online account. Remember, I, I talked about that would be important today as well. So. Um, Either one of those methods um, will work for you at this point. Um, I've been told that a Porto, um, it still might not run super well, especially if you're doing a lot of 3D rendering. It might be slow. Um, I haven't experienced that, but I've had two different people tell me that, so uh, beware of that. So ideally, having um, your own machine that has enough power is the best way to experience Pro. And I clicked one more time. Um, neither one of these runs natively on a Mac. So um, it can be done, but it's also very clunky that way. Um, so yeah, one of the disadvantages of this proprietary software is they developed it pretty much for Windows and not for Macs. So yeah, but I'll show you some examples of alternatives at the end of uh, today's workshop where um, there are GIS um, software that do run okay on a Mac. So I am going to pause right here. This could be like our break number one. I am going to pause um, just like for a minute or two. So you can take a breath, <laughs> get up and stretch, get a, a drink or whatever. Um, when we come back, I'm gonna look at some software options, some basic features, um, and some data organization terms and uh, concepts. Again, that's pretty dry, but again, I just, I just think I have to share that with you so that you'll be aware when you confront uh, some of the terminology and things. So um, yeah, I'll just stop talking for a minute and um, I'll listen if, to see if there's any questions in the, in the chat that I should address right now, but otherwise we'll see you in a minute or two. All right, I'll get one more drink of water and then we'll continue. All righty. So now I'm going to talk about the basic layout of ArcGIS Pro. Um, and we sort of saw this in that one slide I had a, a few slides ago. So at the top, you're going to have the ribbon tabs. And also, I wanted to point out they have a feature that's pretty nice if you're going to be a, a heavy user of Pro. It's called the Quick Access Toolbar. And what you can do is um, maybe in the workflow that you'll be getting into, there will be tools on several different tabs, and you're going to be using them over and over again in a set order. And you don't want to have to keep going from one tab to the other to get to that tool. You can kind of copy the tool up here to the quick access toolbar and that will enable you to get to it all at one swoop so that's a pretty nice feature and yes each tab contains a set of tools that you can use so on the left of your layout for ArcGIS Pro you're going to see what's called the contents pane um, 
in the old days in ArcMap, this was called the table of contents, but now it's called the contents pane. So uh, if I lapse, you'll please forgive me. Um, and the default uh, way it comes in is by drawing order, and we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. But there's other options as well, um, other ways to look at what you've got in your, in your map session. In the center, we have the map pane. And as we saw, a project can have more than one map associated with it. And in this example, um, they're kind of small, but you can see there's three tabs here at the top. So we could flip between uh, the maps represented on each of these tabs, in addition to having that layout we saw earlier where there was a 3D image and, and then two others stacked on top of each other. So a few different ways that you can see multiple maps at once. Um, and at the right, you're going to see other kinds of panes. Um, the catalog pane is the one that comes in by default, I think, but you're going to see other types of panes show up on that right hand side as well as you do things in Pro. So here is where I would show you how to use a Porto. Um, in the interest of time and attention span and all that, what I ended up doing is making a recording. It's about 11 or 12 minutes long, and I've inserted the link to that recording here. I'm not going to show it to you today. Um, maybe at the end, if we have interest, we can go through all of these steps. But it shows you how to get into a Porto if you're a UCR affiliate, and it shows you how to get started with ArcGIS Pro. So I'm going to I'm going to continue on because the next few slides show you some information that I just want to touch on. Um, but again, eventually you you will get a chance to see the recording where I kind of lead you through it step by step. So um, yes, this is about how what happens once you get into a Porto, you look for this folder and you find Pro inside. And then this is the steps that you take when you're done with your session and a few, a few other things to click at the end. So that's the virtual lab machine, right? Um, the demo, the demo uh, recording that I mentioned also shows you how to launch Pro and get started. Um, so once you went into that folder and clicked on ArcGIS Pro, you would see a page that includes something that looks like this. And uh, to start something brand new, you would want to go over to where it says new and then click on map. And then here are some steps where you would want to go to the map tab and look for add data. And this is presupposing that you found some data online or somebody has, has sent it to you and you want to load it into your session. Um, certainly, if you do any of the tutorials, um, this is probably the workflow that you're going to be doing because they've, they've got some data out there for you to grab and things like that. Um, so yeah, you go here and you add the data and you navigate to where the files are and you click on the ones you want and click OK. And the examples that you'll see in this workshop, I'm using shape files from the UCR campus map. So just so you know, it's, it's kind of all consistent. It's all coming from our campus map. And then on the same map tab, if you want to navigate around uh, what you've got pulled up, uh, the Explore tool is what you want to use. It helps you zoom in and uh, do all kinds of things, move to the left or right, and so forth. So um, yeah, that's something else to be aware of. And the very first time you do this, remember I said you add data and you'll um, pull it in and it'll be represented in that map pane. Um, but there's, it's just going to be like shapes, points, lines, or polygons on a white background um, at first. But what helps, of course, is to know where in the world we are when we're looking at this. And the way we do that is with a base map. And um, I'm going to talk about that in a second. I forgot I had this slide first, so let's talk about what's on this slide. Um, the drawing order, it's important because whatever's at the top is going to cover up what's listed below it. So it's kind of like a, a stack of, um, I don't know, anything that's, that's thin, right? So if I pulled in or the campus boundary and I had that at the top of my order, it's a big polygon. It covers the whole extent of what our campus uh, consists of. So it's going to obliterate 
the points I have, which are UCR destinations, and it's also going to obliterate the parking lots that are um, part of our campus. So for this set of data, in this case, what makes the most sense is to put my points on top, and then my, my polygon shapes that are a little bit smaller than the biggest shapes I have, which are the campus boundaries, um, put them in this order, and that way nothing is obscured. Okay, hope, hopefully that makes sense. That's drawing order. And I can't tell you the number of times I've brought data in. I'm like, wait a minute, it's, I'm supposed to be seeing this. Like, oh yeah, I need to rearrange it so I can see it. So here's what, yeah. For a base map, remember we needed to have some context for the shapes we're seeing. The very first time you go into Pro, you're going to want to follow these steps. Go to the Project tab. It's going to take you to a page that lists a bunch of options, and you want to go to Portals. Then when you click on Portals, you're going to go to a page that has this button, Add Portal. You're, if you're a UCR affiliate, here's the address of the portal that you want to add. Then you go back to use this back arrow button, and you'll get back to your map and you can click on base maps and then you'll have choices and you'll see a lot of choices um, and you just get to pick the choice that makes sense for the kind of thing you're looking at if it's a natural feature you might want to focus on one of the uh, base maps that emphasizes uh, the terrain if it's you're all urban you might want to pick a base map that emphasizes the streets the street networks if you don't if you just need like context um, you know, in general, you might want to use one of the very simple base maps. Um, yeah, so you've got choices on what you have sitting in back of your data, but you don't have to, for instance, create a map of the city of Riverside. You're going to have a base map that'll do that, represent that for you. Um, I wanted to mention about tools because some people are just all anxious about where can I get to all the good stuff where I can do all my analysis. So there is an analysis tab, how about that? And on that tab, there's something that looks like a toolbox and you can click on that. And what shows up is a geoprocessing pane on the right-hand side, right? The, so the left-hand side's all about the contents. All these other kinds of panes show up on the right-hand side. And um, in this one toolbox, there are many sub toolboxes and then there are subgroupings within the toolbox and then there are individual tools yeah it just there's hundreds of tools um, so you get to pick the toolbox that maybe describes the kind of thing you're trying to do and then open it up and take a look and see if you can find a tool that does the thing you want to do and if you're not sure um, just hovering over the name of a tool will give you a, a general idea of what this tool does so that's how you get to doing some of the fun analysis stuff in ArcGIS Pro. Okay, so here's some of the dry parts. Um, I don't expect that you'll remember any of this or almost any of this, um, but it's just I have to go through it so you know what we're talking about. Some of these terms are, are used a lot, so here we go. And um, many of these are specific just to ArcGIS Pro, especially the first one, project, and it's got this kind of suffix at the end. So if you see a file with this, you'll know it's an ArcGIS Pro project. And so a project, it's a collection of related items. And um, two types of content here. It's the files that you create or have brought in to Pro and the connections to folders and servers and data repositories um, that you used. So that this is something new that wasn't in ArcMap, um, but it is like the, overall way that you can collect all the things you're doing on one particular effort that you're you're conducting. So these things are in um, other types of GIS as well as Pro. So GeoDatabase is the big container in which you can put all the other things that you want to represent on your map. Um, if you were going to do some mapping from scratch before you can make a point or or a line or a polygon on the, on the map, you, what you have to do first is go ahead and create a ge geo database that's going to be the container for the layers that you want to create. Um, 
So in a geodatabase, you can group related things together into what's called a feature data set or not. So here we've got two uh, feature classes in this feature data set, but here we have some feature classes that are just by themselves. They're not grouped. That's fine too. It's just like using folders. You know, you get to decide what's worth it and what's not. Uh, you can have annotation in here in your geo database. Uh, you can have a raster in here as well. And you can have even like a, a table that you have in there just for reference, but it doesn't have any spatial data. So all kinds of things, but there's the hierarchy. Geo database is the big container. You can, you may or may not have a feature data set or two in your geo database, but it for sure contains feature classes, what's called feature classes that correspond to particular topics in your map. Yes, more confusion here, bear with me. A shape file, um, that's the file that you would get from somebody else if they said, hey, I want you to see what I came up with. I'm gonna send you my shape file. And that's vector, vector data, right? Um, so shapefile is like the equivalent to a feature class like we saw on the previous slide, like, um, you know, streets or uh, municipal boundaries or things like that. So a layer is what we call a feature class once it's loaded into your GIS. So it's kind of like if you think of those phase transformations, like we call it water when it's liquid and we call it ice when it's solid. Well, it's just kind of, I think of it in those terms. So um, you have a feature class and you load it into your GIS and then it's referred to as a layer after that. And then you would think a layer file, that sounds like what a shape file should be called, right? Because it's a file containing my layer, but no, <laughs> that's not it. A layer file actually doesn't store the data itself, but it stores everything else that you have done to that data to represent it in your GIS. So for instance, um, maybe the, the way that you've symbolized, you've uh, chosen like a, this color of pink for this feature and this size of point for that feature. Um, so all that information can be transmitted to somebody else in a layer file. And this is helpful if you do have a team of people maybe working on different subsets of a, a large area and you want all their maps to end up looking the same so people don't have to create their own symbology from scratch they can just use like the standard one that's been created for this project so that's what a layer file uh contains and it gets real confusing i've i've had at least two questions from from people at ucr where there's like um i got this layer file but it doesn't have any data in it and it's like yeah that's that's kind of how it goes <laughs> so it's um you can export a layer and that's different from sending somebody a layer file Sad but true. All right, so now I need to talk a little bit more about data management. Um, there's a, what's called a catalog pane and a catalog view. And they're both something that you can access from the view tab on ArcGIS Pro. Um, if you just need some very basic data management, a catalog pane will probably do it for you. It's gonna be one of those panes that pops up in the right-hand side of your ArcGIS Pro session. And this is where you can make folder connections. This is where you would go ahead and create a new geo database of data sets and feature classes. Like if you're doing the work, the work, the mapping yourself, um, that's your starting point is to create all of these containers for the things that you're going to make on the screen. Um, you can search for things by typing in keywords in the catalog pane. And if you've got a list of things in your catalog pane and you know you want to add them to your map, you can just go ahead and drag them, drag them and drop them over into your, um, your map pane. So that's catalog pane. Now what's a catalog view get you? Well, for one thing, that's going to open up in that big center map pane. And you can do all the things that we talked about with a catalog pane and more. So you can work with data that's um, you know, not just the, the project you're working on currently, but other data that you may have floating around. Um, you can edit metadata. And I'll pause here because I know not everybody knows what metadata refers to. It's information about the data set that you have. So um, maybe you're browsing the internet and you're trying to find data of um, 
vegetation in Western Riverside County. And you find a, a data set that you can download and it looks okay, that's what I want, so I'm gonna use this. And then when you open it up, you realize that it was made 25 years ago and that the only classes of data they used were tree, shrub, or grass, and you were hoping to get species data. And the biggest or the smallest unit that's mapped is five acres, everything's like five acres or larger, and you were hoping for half acre resolution. So metadata, if it's done well, um, is a file that goes along with the data that you either create or find, and it will spell out all these things, like what year was it made? What, what granularity are we talking about here? What are the categories of data? Um, all that good stuff. How, how reliable do we think this is? Um, so yeah, when you're looking for data to use, uh, look for a metadata file and it will tell you more about the data um, before you actually go through the process of downloading it and, um, and opening it up and finding out the hard way that this is not what I wanted, I better keep looking. Um, so yes, you can edit metadata in the catalog view. You can see a visualization of something like what it would look like on the map if you used it. <clears throat> and um, the important thing here with ArcGIS is that you need to use catalog pane or catalog view to copy, move, rename, or delete spatial data sets. Doing it in Windows is not going to work out well for you. Um, so it's, they're unusual files that way. You can understand how complicated this is and um, all the, the moving parts to it and everything. So for whatever reason, the way it's set up, um, manipulating your basic file functions in Windows is not going to do it for you. And uh, you would need to come to the catalog pane to do some of that work catalog pane or catalog view. Okay, so now I'm going to start talking about one um, process that you would probably use a lot if you're going to use GIS and that's selection. And here we see on the map tab, there's a bunch of tools relating to selection. In um, ArcGIS products, when something is selected, it kind of turns this turquoise color and what a selection allows you to do is to edit the selected features. Um, so it's like if you're paranoid and it's like, oh, I don't want to pan around in this map because I'm afraid I'm accidentally going to delete something. You can't delete anything unless it's selected first. So there's a kind of a, a safeguard there for that kind of uh, mishap. Um, a selection also allows you to assess the attributes of only the features that are selected. And so instead of looking at thousands and thousands of data points, um, if you only need 12 of those, you can just look at those and nothing else. And you can also see which features have a particular attribute. Um, so we'll take a look at how all of this works. Okay, so the next few slides are um, talking about the demonstration. I think I do want to show you this recording. So, I need to do things um, in a certain order to make this work right, so bear with me. I'm going to do a new share. I'm going to share my computer sound. I am going to stop my slideshow. And And I apologize for the sound on this, it's not the best. So now we're going to take a look at selection. Okay, this is a pretty basic thing, it's really helpful in a lot of ways, and we'll take a look at why that is. So um, here we are, we're still on the map tab, and we have our selection tools on the map tab, and that's what we're going to be using. First though, I'd like to call your attention to the contents pane, and the default version of the contents pane that comes in is by drawing order. So that's what we talked about you know, a little while ago where um, what's on top matters, it covers up what's down below. But there's other ways that we might want to organize our contents. And one of them is if we go over 
to two icons away, list by selection. So let's put that on and see what that looks like. Um, so this allows us to make a layer selectable or not. And sometimes it's a good idea not to have a layer selectable. Sometimes you just don't want to mess with that even by accident. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I don't want the campus boundary selectable because um, I want to select some destination points. And, but unless I'm super duper careful, I'm also going to end up selecting the polygon that's down below them. And I, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to hassle with that. So what I can do is con come on over here uh, to this by selection and uncheck campus boundary. And that'll mean that no matter what I do, I'm not going to be able to select it until I toggle this back on again. So let me go back to the by drawing order because that's, that's what the default is and everything. And now I'm going to use the uh, selection tool. They give you lots of choices on um, how to select. If, I think rectangle is the default, but there's other ways you could select. And um, let's go over here and just select a few points, destination points. So let me choose these two. And now you can see they turned that color. And uh, what we can do now is go over to the destinations layer and right click on it. And one of the many things that comes up up here toward the top is attribute table. So if I click on that, it shows up down here, uh, all the, the different you know, attributes for all the different points. And I can start scrolling and the ones that I have selected, oops, there's one, um, will show up in the same color. So that tells me what, has, what I have selected. And here's the second one. And sometimes you want to know what features are and what their, their attributes are and all that. But scrolling through the attribute table is, is kind of a pain. Um, there's, a, there's one way around it is down here we can toggle the option to only show the selected layers. So now we have them both together. But another thing we can do is go back up here to the, our selection uh, grouping up here on this tab, and here's attributes. So if I click on that, uh, look to your right where it now has the catalog pane. Um, what's going to show up now is something about attributes. And I have those same two attributes showing up, and I could just scroll through and look at, look at their attributes um, one at a time over here. That's a little bit easier than panning back and forth through the attribute table. So I'm going to close the attribute table now. And I'm going to clear my selection. So we're back to nothing is selected right now. And the next thing I'm going to do is show you a couple other ways that you can uh, select features. And one is by attributes. So we, right up here next to the tool I just used, we have select by attributes. If I click on that, again, uh, look over to your right. And it's taking a little bit of time, but something is going to happen really fast. <laughs> really fast. Yeah, not so fast. And this, this is like the first time uh, in this map, so it's taking longer than it would once you get going and, and try it again. OK, so this allows us to say, I just want to see all the features in this layer that have a particular attribute. And in this case, I am thinking of UCR destinations, and I want to know where all the ATMs are on campus, because I think that's a useful thing to know. So um, let's go ahead and um, for selection type, I want a new selection. Uh, sometimes what you can do is make a selection and then do another selection from that selection. So that's that's why we have cho choices there. But right now we're starting with a new selection. And I'm going to click New Expression here. So this gives us a little expression builder. And what I want to do is I happen to know that ATMs are one of the uh, attributes that we find under service underscore TY for service type. So I'm going to say I want a so selection where service type is, that works for me, I think that says is equal to, yes. And now it's going to, it knows all the attributes that are in that column, 
and luckily ATM starts with an A, so it's alphabetical and it starts pretty much close to the top. So um, that's my that's my expression. And now I'm going to click Run down here at the bottom. And it's done. Um, it would tell me if there's any problems with what I just did. Um, but I see some points are lit up. And if I want to verify that it did it correctly, I can go back over here to destinations. I'm right clicking. I can pick attribute table. And I can scroll down. And look, there's an ATM. And there's an ATM. And there are three more. So I could go again over to this option and just look at the ones I have selected and every single one is an ATM. So that's how that works. Um, pretty handy tool. I'm going to close this and I'm going to clear my selection. Now I'm going to show you a different way to select features and we did it by attribute. So we knew what kind of uh, option or attribute we wanted, but maybe sometimes we want to uh, select by location and not have to do it manually by going around and, and picking all the things on the map. And I'll show you how that works. Um, so if I click on the select by location up here, now I have a different geoprocessing uh, pane open. And what I want, you know, this has changed from the way it was done in ArcMap and it's a little bit of an improvement, but I still find it confusing. So don't, don't feel bad if you find it confusing because I've been doing this for years and I still find this process confusing. Um, my input features here are going to be UCR destinations. So luckily that came up the way I wanted it to, but I have the option of changing it to one of my other layers. And I'm looking at what I'm going to try to do is find all the destination points that are within the campus boundary. As you can see, there are a few what are considered UCR destinations, but they're outside the campus boundary. So um, let me just get the ones that are all within the campus boundary. So the relationship here I'm after isn't really intersect, and they give you all kinds of options. And I am going to go with completely within. Okay. Now they use the selecting features uh, term, which that's one of the confusing parts to me. But what I want to do is get all the UCR destinations that are completely within the campus boundary. So I have that option when I click the drop down, and I'm going to pick that. I'm not setting any kind of search distance. It's going to be a new selection. And so I'll just go ahead and run this. And now you can see a bunch of points are lit up, and you can see that the ones outside the campus boundary are not lit up. So that's how select by location goes. So hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, these slides kind of go over what we just saw. And there we are with selecting, um, seeing our attributes in that attribute pane that can pop up on the right-hand side, um, doing the geoprocessing uh, select by attributes, where we picked, I want to see all the ATMs. and. Um, then select by location, where I want all the destinations that are within a particular other uh, layer that we have on the map. So hopefully this will help you if you uh, want to try it on your own with some data that you uh, come across. Um, but this is, this is probably a pretty common uh, set of um, you know, steps to take, no matter what kind of data you're using. Um, so here, 
I didn't know exactly where to throw this in, but I just wanted to show you that if you were thinking of creating your own data, the tab that you're going to become very familiar with is the edit tab. And you can see over here in the features section, we've got, um, this is where you would start by creating. You can also modify, which is something I used to do a lot. It's like I would draw a line or a polygon boundary and like, no, that doesn't look like I've got that quite right. So I could go back and, uh, and change the positioning of some of the, the vertexes, uh, vertices that I had created. So anyway, if you are going to do some uh, work or manipulation with, um, with data, um, the editor tab is where you want to be. Uh, I'll mention real quick the snapping. Um, you know how some things you just want them to be coincident? Like if you think back way back to that slide with the vector data and we had the manholes uh, sitting right on top of where the pipes came together, um, you would want that to snap together. You don't want to take it by chance that you were just a little bit off, you know, you, you would want to have that right on. So snapping is the, that kind of a thing where if you want something to be coincident, you can set um, a tolerance level where if it gets within 10 pixels or something like that, it'll snap together with whatever feature is, is there. So that's a handy thing to have. All right, at this point, this is where I was going to take our second uh, break. So we're about 35 minutes from the end, and um, I will just stop talking for a little bit, and um, we all can take a drink and a pause and check our emails, and um, then we'll get to the end where we're talking about um, some tutorial uh, suggestions, some more concepts, and other GIS software. I have another uh, video I could show, but I'm not sure, given the time, whether we just might run through the slides that illustrate what the video shows. So um, stay tuned for that one. But anyway, I'll stop talking for a minute or so now, and y'all can, can take a stretch break. So see you in a minute. OK, so I've seen a few messages from a couple people who have to duck out. And totally understandable, this is a long long stretch. Um, but again, uh, like I said, you'll be getting uh, access to all of these materials uh, and more um, in the future. So you can look at them at your leisure if you do have to bow out before the end. So thanks again for hanging in there this long. And let's see what we've got coming up. Symbology. So yeah, um, when your data loads in, it's represented as, of course, points, lines, or polygons if we're talking about vector data. But you might not like the way it looks when it loads in. I hardly ever do. I always want to change the representation of, of, of what the default is. And so you have choices. And they've made it a little bit simpler um, than it used to be. So that's good news, right? Um, but if you're learning this for the first time, that doesn't matter. This is, this is the kind of uh, options that you have. So what I've done here is done screenshots for uh, points. And then in the middle, we have lines. And in the middle, we have polygons. So um, what loads in by default is a single symbol. So anything, for instance, that you see our destinations, it all looks like that little small kind of maroon uh, point symbol. It doesn't matter what it is. But you have the option of changing that. So for instance, if I wanted to make ATMs a different uh, color or a different symbol even, maybe I want the little money, you know, like a dollar bill kind of symbol for that. Um, there's ways you can do that. So you can customize what the symbol looks like based on uh, a particular value in a particular column on your attribute table. Does that make sense? Yeah. So similar thing with the lines, um, maybe you have road classes and you would want, you don't want all your roads to look the same on your map. You would want dirt roads to maybe be a dashed line and um, two lane roads to be a, a thin line and a freeway to be a big fat line. So yeah, you have choices that you can make based on what your attributes are. And they're also showing you that you can uh, change representation maybe based on color, or by size of symbols. Um, certainly we see that on the uh, coronavirus map from Johns Hopkins. They've chosen to make all the symbols red circles, but if there's more cases um, for that location, the circle is bigger than one next door that doesn't have as many cases. So um, 
anyway, ArcGIS Pro allows you to establish all of that um, for points, lines, or polygons. So here's the demo, and I'm just thinking, I think I'm going to skip the recording. Um, I'll just talk you through it, and you can watch the recording at your leisure if you'd like to. Um, because like I said, for myself at least, I always want to change the symbology. So I just wanted to demonstrate how that would happen. Um, so in this demonstration, what you'll see when you view the recording is I wanted to make the campus boundary not a solid color, but I wanted to make it look more like a boundary where there's nothing in the middle of the polygon, but I have the exterior boundary uh, emphasized so that people could see what's underneath the campus boundary and um, what's and where the boundary is versus where it's not. So to do that, um, one thing you can do is go over to your contents pane and uh, click on the little rectangular symbol that represents what it looks like now. You get this window that appears. I talk you through some of the, it may not look like what you need and that I was befuddled for a minute or two when I first saw this, but there's a way you can drag it down so that you do get to the part where you can change the color, you can change the outline color, you can change the outline width. Um, so you can see I went through those steps and I changed what was a solid yellow polygon to something that um, is clear, no, nothing shading, no nothing in the middle, but I've got a nice distinct line around the outside that shows me where the, the campus boundaries are. And you can fiddle, of course, with color selection, I always recommend choosing something bright and contrasting, even if it, they're colors that you don't normally like in real life. Uh, you, contrast is the name of the game. You want it to be super clear to anybody viewing it uh, what this thing is and not have it closely resemble something else on your map, right? Ah, yes. So I clicked again just to highlight this is the, uh, the uh, important part of setting this basic symbol up. And for labeling polygons, so this looks complicated, but it's really not. It's just, it kind of bounces around a lot. Um, so when you click in your contents pane, if you click on the name of a layer, what happens up here at the top with all the ribbons is you'll get a few extra ribbons. And it's kind of like if you're you know, used to Microsoft products and it, maybe you have an image on your, your Word doc clicked and all of a sudden you get um, extra, um, you know, tabs about changing the appearance of this image. So it's same, same kind of idea. If you click on a layer, you get a few extra tabs where you can mess around with what's going on with that layer. And appearance is one of them, uh, which we just handled by a shortcut um, by clicking on it in the table or the contents pane rather. Um, and labeling is another one. So maybe in my case, I wanted to see what the lot ID was for the parking lots on my map. Um, so I wanted to go over here and in the field, I would set that to lot ID. So the field in this case means the column heading in my attribute table. That's what I'm after. So lot ID is what I want. Um, I would come over to the other side here and if I wanted to change the font or the size of the font or whether it's bold or regular, I can do all that over here. And then this is a part that um, I always kind of hiccup on, but I guess I understand why it happens. Um, you go through all this work and the labels aren't going to appear on your map unless you click over here with this enable labeling uh, symbol. So you have to kind of opt in after you do all that work to really see the labels on your map. You have to opt in and you can also toggle this to turn the labels back off. So in this case, um, this is what it looked like when I went through it, right? So yeah gives you an idea. And of course, you can change the size, the font, all that good stuff. Okay, so this, this is going to be uh, helpful for you, I think. Um, Esri is getting better and better all the time at helping people learn how to use their software. And I copied this and the next slide from their website. So these links down here are not live, but this link is so when you get the slides you'll be able to click on that and you'll see exactly what I'm showing on this slide in the next. So like I said you might be like oh I didn't really learn what I wanted to learn from this this workshop today but I'm showing you where you can go to learn more. Um, 
tutorials 10 to 60 minutes in length with a preview video. And uh, for instance, if you're interested in how you can upload a table to create points on a map, they've got a workshop down here, a, a, a tutorial, sorry, down here, where they show you how to do that. Um, more symbology of your map layers. Uh, we've got a tutorial for that. So you get the idea that um, I think this is just better. You'll take, take your own time, pick, pick the adventure that you want to go on and, and go for it. Um, this also is from the Esri website. Again, just this link at the top is live. These are not because it's just a, a screenshot. But it gives you um, other options too. So um, if you are interested in routing, for instance, they give you um, some more tutorials on that. Um, making reports, finding addresses, and so forth and so on. So anyway, I hope this is going to be helpful for you. Um, and as a UCR affiliate, you will have access to all of this. Um, and a lot of these are free to anyone on, on the web. So some of their training is um, free and some of it is for a fee. But if you're a UCR affiliate, you can get to any training pretty much um, for free if you go in a certain way through the ArcGIS Online um, option. So I can explain more about that uh, later on. You can contact me later if you're interested in knowing more about that. OK, so we have concepts. And again, this can be pretty dry. And I, I apologize, but I'm sorry. I just think it helps to know about this kind of stuff because um, it can get you into trouble if you don't. So we're going to talk about projections and coordinate systems and datum and georeferencing. Georeferencing is not too bad. I like that one. But these others, yeah, they're pretty dry. Um, so at this point in the workshop, what I usually like to do is if I'm, if I'm at UCR library, I would bring in a globe and hold it up for everybody to see what a globe looks like. And um, at home here, I normally hold up an orange. So we can talk about, do we agree that this is the basic shape of the Earth? It is a most like a round sphere. Um, and th unfortunately, this time, the uh, orange in my refrigerator is kind of elongated. <laughs> so I'm like, no, this isn't going to work. <laughs> Never mind the orange. Um, but the concept is picture a globe, picture any round spherical object that has stuff on the surface. And how would you get that into two dimensions? How, what, where would you slice the, the cover of the orange or the, the tennis ball or whatever it is? And how would you flatten that out into two dimensions? It's not easy. Um, there would be parts always wanting to stick up from the surface, right? Uh, the little rounded parts, or it would crack a lot. Or if your sphere was covered with silly putty, for instance, you might be able to slice that off and lay it flat on a surface and make it a rectangle. But think about it, something's going to get distorted, right? So um, how do we deal with that? Well. Um, Smart people from way back when maps were first being created have, have considered and pondered that question. And they came up with these examples uh, and more. But these are the three basic examples that I'm going to show you now. So yeah, the best we can do sometimes is pretend there's a light bulb in the center of the Earth. And it's projecting out through the surface. And we've got this big old cylinder that surrounds the Earth. And then we cut the cylinder and lay it flat. and there we go. We've got two dimensions now of what was once we could only see in the third dimension, right? Um, the conic projection, same basic idea, except you've got a big cone outside the Earth now instead of a cylinder. And a orthographic is a third option. And if you think to some of the maps that you've seen in the past, you may go, oh yeah, I remember like I saw a map like this and Greenland is like absolutely enormous. and. Antarctica is really big and occupies all this bottom space and so forth. Um, yeah, so these are some ways of uh, handling the projection issue. Um, there are more, and smart people are working on it all the time to try to get better and better at it. But the thing with the projection is that something has to give. We haven't figured out a way to preserve everything from that spherical surface in the two dimensions. And it might be one or more of these qualities that has to be distorted. Um, and the projection you pick 
is often influenced by what purpose your map is going to be used for. If you think about uh, mariners who sail all the seas, um, they are most interested in distance and direction, right? They want to get from point A to point B, and the distance and the direction is most important to them. If the shape is distorted, if the area is distorted, um, not as important. And, you know, the opposite is true for other people, that they want to see as accurate uh, shape portrayal as possible and so forth and so on. So um, there's lots more to say about projection, but I just want to show you differences it can make. Uh, this is an old illustration like the previous one, but it's also very instructive. Um, look at what happens with the, a map of the United States based on using three different projections. None of them are wrong. It's just they use different methods for different purposes, but when you try to line them all up together, you've got big problems if you're not in Kansas, <laughs> pretty much, right? Florida is like totally, whoa, Maine, um, Washington State, and so forth. So yeah, I think you can understand now why I'm talking about this. Um, it, you could run into trouble if you're bringing in data from that has used different projections. So now I have uh, a couple more things to say, and then we'll get into the workarounds that ArcGIS Pro has. Um, so kind of going hand in hand with projections, we can think about coordinate systems. Um, on the globe, as we remember back from whenever we learned about the globe, um, we measured uh, position by latitude and longitude, right? Like the equator is zero degrees latitude, if you go north from the equator, it's, we're talking about the angle formed from the center of the Earth to that position on the globe above the equator. And same idea with longitude, right? We start at zero degrees longitude that goes through, what is it, Greenwich, England, and then we talk about angles on either side of that, um, positive or negative. Uh, it, once you've got your data projected, though, you can get into things that look more familiar to us back from our geometry days when we had that uh, the x and y axis, right? So we can have all kinds of projected coordinate systems like state plane or UTM. If you, uh, that's universal transverse Mercator uh, is what that stands for. So those are what coordinate systems you might encounter. There's many more, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for there's either global or sphere, spherical. Those are maybe used interchangeably or projected coordinate systems. And then we have this other term that's called a datum. And oh my goodness, a datum, um, here are some common ones that are used these days. This is North American datum from 1983. Uh, this one is the one from 1984, and it's, it's used a lot with um, maps on the internet, right? Um, so a datum is pretty much, if you think of the Earth, it's not a perfect sphere. It kind of looks like it is, but it's a little flatter at the poles and stretches out at the equator and things like that. So the mathematicians and all that who come up with these uh, projections and whatnot, they need a point that they can say, I'm hooking my, uh, my modeled imagining of a perfect world to the real world at this point, and that's that place where it connects up uh, the model to reality. That's called the datum. And I'm mentioning this because even if you have stuff in the same coordinate system and same projection, if the map makers used a different datum, your, da your data also might not line up. And that's depressing, isn't it? We would, we would want everything to line up and be where it's supposed to be in re reference to each other. And by the way, there's a new datum coming out. Um, these have been in use for many years, but I think there's one that's coming out in 2022, perhaps. So yeah, in the future, I'll have a different uh, set of numbers and letters up, up here when I'm talking about datum. So good news and not so good news, maybe, for ArcGIS Pro users. Um, ArcGIS Pro reprojects data on the fly. So it takes whatever your first layer is that you added into your system. And if you add a, a new layer that's in a different projection or coordinate system, um, it's going to just make that one match to the first one. So everything will line up. So hooray. That sounds good, right? Well, it, it is OK for viewing or doing mapping. It works fine. However, because the computer is thinking so hard to keep reprojecting all the time, um, 
you're going to see some performance issues if, if you just let ArcGIS Pro do its thing and reproject. It's not okay. It's not going to work out well if you're doing any kind of analysis or editing. So the solution is that, remember I showed you that toolbox with all those different types of tools? Well, there are some tools that you can use uh, when you first bring something new in. And that will render it once and for all in the, the coordinate system that you want it to be in. So it's just another couple steps to do when you're first loading in data. And I wanted to show you this next slide because you're like, well, how do I know what projection <laughs> and coordinate system my data is in, right? You might see it in the metadata, but another way you can get to it is within ArcGIS Pro. If you right click on the layer in the contents pane and choose properties, uh, a window like this pops up and there's a whole bunch of properties you can look at. But if you chick click on the source uh, choice at left, you'll get a window that looks like this. And if you expand the spatial reference window, you'll, there you go. There's, you're seeing, look, NAD 83. Now you know what that is. That's a datum, right? And state plane, um, that's a projected coordinate system. So, uh, and look, it was a, um, originally a Lambert conic um, projection. So yeah, um, so there's all your information about what data you have. And this is where you can go to to make sure you're getting everything else matching um, this. Once you, when you need the input for the tools that do that, this is where you go to find that, that out. Hope that makes sense. All right, georeferencing. I like talking about this because it's kind of fun. Um, you might find a scanned map of an old map, say like an old map of Italy or something like that. And you're like, great, I want to put this in uh, to, my, to my GIS and make comparisons between what it looks like today and it did back then. And so you upload your uh, TIFF file and you try to find it in your GIS and it's like, it's nowhere. It's like you zoom to layer and it's way out somewhere. You can't even imagine where it is. And so why is that? Well. GIS is smart about a lot of things, but it's not going to be able to recognize that a map of Italy is the same as where Italy is on the map, the base map that you've got uh, going on in your GIS. So what you need to do is um, a task called georeferencing where you find this image or this map and you find really identifiable points on both of them. Like here's a street intersection, that's really good or this tall tower or something like that. And you just create a series of points linking one to the other, and you wanna disperse it over the scanned image. So you don't want them all bunched up in one corner um, cause that'll maybe end up with distortion. So you try to, try to find things in all corners in the middle sort of idea. Um, and then you hit presto and um, then you'll see your map of Italy where it needs to be. And I, I wanna give you a tip here at the bottom um, if you're looking for data online and you have options of what to download and there might be a JPEG, there might be a PNG, there might be a TIFF and there, if you see something that's called a GeoTIFF, that's the one you want to get because they've already done this georeferencing work for you and that information is stored in the image that you're downloading. So if you have an option for a GeoTIFF, you want to get that one and it, it, it bypasses the need to do this georeferencing. Okay, so we're almost at the end. I just wanted to show you that there are other choices for software other than ArcGIS. And at this point, I think Margarita is going to be putting the link in the chat to the um, evaluation, the assessment for this workshop. So um, you can be looking for that. And again, take a minute or two at the end to, uh, to go ahead and let us know what you think. So anyway, we are going to look at some examples and why you might use one over the other. Uh, there's, there's a lot, but again, ArcGIS has like the huge portion of the market share. So here's QGIS. Um, it's cool. Number one, it's free. So you don't have to be affiliated with UCR to get it for free. You can just go to their website and download it. Um, it's open source, so that means a, um, a community of developers is working on making this and making improvements to it. They're not motivated by profit, they're motivated by the goodness of their hearts. 
And look, it runs on a Mac as just as easily as it runs on Windows. So I would say in my experience, QGIS is the uh, next best alternative to ArcGIS, at least that's the way a lot of people see it, um, especially if they're Mac users. Um, they just, yeah, let's, let's use QGIS. And the nice thing is that it, you can export things from QGIS and put them into ArcMap and or ArcMap, ArcGIS Pro and vice versa. So um, there's some, it, they play well together. Uh, on data products and things. So that's that's helpful as well. So even if you're using QGIS, you can share what you've done with somebody who's using ArcGIS. And I gave a workshop on QGIS in the spring and I'm gonna give another one in uh, fall term, probably late October. So be on the lookout for that if you're curious about QGIS. Google Earth Pro, um, Google Earth can do some things. Uh, and again, it's, it's pretty much accessible. Um, there's no, no pay barrier or anything like that for the most part. Um, I know one faculty member in Earth Sciences who has done two projects that have taken him years and years, and he used uh, Google Earth to make the, the data sets that he was creating. Um, he just thought it, for his situation, this was the best tool to use. So it's not unheard of, and I just wanted to put that out there for you. Um, it just might be what you would want to use instead of ArcGIS. So another uh, option, which is open source, that means it's free. You just download it and start using it. And this is called Grass GIS. Uh, the origin story here was that it was originally developed by the Army Corps of Engineers and um, a, a uh, contractor, I guess, for the Army Corps saw it and said, hey, this is good. You should let you know, more people use it. So, so it kind of turned into this this other alternative. Um, and what I've been told is I haven't used it myself. What I've been told is that it's best for if you're processing raster data, um, doing a lot of uh, spatial analysis, it's like the heavy duty stuff. So it's, it's not super easy to learn. And, uh, but if, if you're going to be doing uh, image processing, data, uh, image classification, that kind of thing, um, you might want to take a look at GRASS GIS. Oh, Carto, I always love, they have such lovely, um, you know, lovely graphics. Uh, Carto used to be free, and then they decided to maybe just make a free version that's pretty lightweight, and if you want more features, you've got to pay for it. Um, and my impression is, I don't know if this is 100% true, but it, it used to be one of the favorites among um, academics. and as it's shifted to being uh, mostly uh, usable if you pay for it, uh, they have kind of dropped off on using Carto, but you gotta hand it to them. That's just lovely, um, the way they visualize that. So yeah, there's Carto, and you might see some uh, products that were made uh, using Carto. And for you Mac users out there, um, maybe you're not sure about open source uh, QGIS or GRASS or whatever, um, Mac has made its own GIS software. It's called Cartographica. Um, and here's an example. I wasn't even sure it, it was still going because I hadn't seen a lot of chatter out there about it, but apparently it is still available. So um, you might want to take a look at this, but honestly, I have not encountered anybody who uses it. Not to say that I just haven't met them yet, but um, yeah, I don't hear too much about Cartographica but it is an option for you Mac users there. All right, here's the question slide. That means we're at the end, hooray. You stuck with it. Um, yeah, I wanna thank you guys. I hope that was helpful. Um, you know, again, sorry that we can't be in person and we could walk around and try some of the same things together, but uh, someday, someday we'll get back to campus and we can do that. Um, Here's my information, my contact information, and we have about 10 minutes left uh, till four o'clock. So what I am going to do is end my slideshow. And uh, let's see. There is a question. Okay, I did see that pop up, yeah. So let me do this. Okay, so I saw you can link directly from ArcGIS with Google Earth. 
I wouldn't say directly, and I don't know a lot about this. I do think there is a way um, that it can be done. So uh, Daniel, if you wanted to talk about that later, I would need to do some research and get back to you on that. Um, yeah, but it's, I guess, I'm, I'm thinking about it more. Um, the files that you create with Google Earth are known as KMZs or KMLs. And I think there's a way that you can export data that's created in ArcMap or, or ArcGIS Pro and choose a KML as an option of how it's exported. So in that sense, um, that may be the answer to your question there, that you could exchange files that way. Um, yeah, but we could look into that some more if, if you need to. Um, Okay, any other questions or are, are you all busy um, taking the assessment? Um, and I hope this wasn't too, too brutal. Um, long time, a hot day, at least it's hot where I am. So thank you all for sticking with it. And uh, you'll have my contact information. Um, we can do any follow-ups one-on-one uh, -one or more suggestions on where you can get uh, more in-depth training. You know, so feel free to reach out if you need to. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Um, I'm, what I'm gonna do is uh, stop recording now. And um, yeah, and we'll, we'll see how it all turns out for you. Um, thanks again for, I think you're really smart to take the time to explore what GIS is and how you might be able to use it. And um, you know, hopefully this is just the beginning, but it's, it's honestly not for everybody. Um, it just depends. So, you know, some people just take to it and um, you know, it changes their life, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that doesn't happen for everybody. And some people just view it as a tool and that's okay too. So, uh, yeah. Um, all right. Well, you all have a good one. I'll, I'll still stay on the line, but I'm just going to stop recording at this point.